All the way from Wichita Falls, would you welcome Jordan Wright? Well, hallelujah. Good morning. Well, not good morning. I'm going to say good morning all the time during the sermon. I got a feeling, but good evening. Good to be with you all tonight. Uh, my name is Jordan Wright. Uh, my wife, Michelle, daughter, Leanne, and uh, two weeks from today, uh, baby girl, Lily, uh, are uh, new missionaries to Indonesia. She, she wasn't born two weeks ago. She's going to be born two weeks from now. So normally my wife comes with me, uh, but she is at home close to that hospital just in case. And so uh, many of you were here uh, last time I was here. And so uh, I, Paul, I'm going to say some things tonight. I'm not preaching the same sermon, don't worry. But I'm going to say some of some things tonight so that everyone knows what we do in Indonesia and what all that is like. I told pastor, I said, you're really making me work for my money. Because missionaries, usually we preach the same sermon every Sunday. We go to a different church, and they haven't heard it, and so we just preach the same one. And, and you've already heard my good one, and so now i gotta, I got to preach a not good one, I guess. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll be good tonight. And so you can go ahead and open up your Bibles tonight, the book of Matthew, chapter 28. We'll be by there here in a minute. But uh, we are brand new missionaries to the nation of Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. Uh, you got uh, United, well, sorry, you got China, uh, United, uh, India, uh, United States, and then fourth place is Indonesia. It's also the world's largest Muslim country, uh, world's largest Muslim country. About 80% of the population of Indonesia uh, is Muslim, and the rest are Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Christian, and the like. About 10% Sorry, about 5% of the population of Indonesia uh, considers themselves to be Christian evangelical. Uh, they're very localized in certain areas, uh, but four out of five evangelicals in Indonesia are Pentecostal charismatic. So go figure, it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but Pentecost is vibrant there in Indonesia and, and ready there to empower the church, uh, to plant more churches and to go and see the kingdom of darkness driven out. And so Indonesia is, is an island nation of over 17 thousand different islands now i'm from arkansas we can't count that high but seventeen thousand islands and six thousand of those islands actually have people on them only six thousand right uh, on six thousand islands live over 700 different tribes and people groups 400 of those have their own language and so over 400 different languages spoken in indonesia about 236 people groups in Indonesia comes about 170 million people live right now in cultures and societies that for the last 2,000 years, they have never had a church. For the last 2,000 years, generation after generation, never hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, we are, we are so blessed here in Texas. One of these days I'm going to count as I travel to a service how many churches that I, that I pass by. You know, so many churches here. I even pass by a Chick-fil-A, right? So many ways that we can hear about Jesus uh, here in Texas, and yet these people, they have, no, they have no way. And so our heart is to go to Indonesia to plant the church where it's never been. I told this story last time I was here, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why Indonesia? So like I said, I'm from Arkansas originally, uh, and yes, I married my cousin, but it's my second cousin, so it's fine. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but I uh, grew up in Arkansas, grew up Pentecostal, some of us got church. I'm eight years old, went to kids' camp, was saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, called into ministry all in the same week. I figured I'd just get it all done in one go. You know, who needs to go back? I got it all done in one week. Uh, came back to that campground as a 16 year old for youth camp. There at the Arkansas District, and uh, the camp evangelist that week was the national director for Speed the Light. Those of you who may not be familiar with Speed the Light, Speed the Light is the way that the Assemblies of God students give to missions. And so he was there, to, he talked about missions that very last night, and uh, he, 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 at the end of the message, he said, if you're called into ministry, I want you to come down to the front and tell God you'll be a missionary if that's what he wants you to do. Now, I didn't know God took volunteers, but he does. I went down to the front and I said, God, I don't know what you're doing, but this is what you want for my life. I'll, I'll do it. You see, all, all God is looking for is a willing heart. 
All God is looking for is for someone to say, here I am, send me. It doesn't matter what our qualifications are. It doesn't matter what our talents are, what our backgrounds are. All God is, is wanting for someone to say yes. And if he can get one person to say yes, I believe he can change the world. Amen? And so I, I said, yes, okay, and, and power of God hit me. I hit my knees, began to weep and cry there in the presence of the Lord. I can still take you back to that same tile there at that campground. And the only way I can explain it to you what happened next is that I saw a vision of a dark-complected Asian girl with tear marks down her face, and I heard the voice of God speak and say, Jordan, I want you to be my missionary to the nation of Indonesia. Now, I'm from Arkansas, right? <laughs> So what does that mean? That means I don't write good, I don't talk good, I don't add good, I don't know nothing. And so I had never heard of Indonesia before. It sounded like some kind of disease to me. I don't know, you got a bad case of Indonesia or something. But I didn't know where it was and until that night when God called me. That was 12 years ago this last summer. Uh, after that, I went to Southwestern Assemblies of God University, got a degree in missions, met my wife, uh, who was also getting her degree in missions. And fun fact, she was actually called to missions the same exact summer that I was called into missions. Uh, I was called in Hot Springs, Arkansas. She was called in Wichita Falls, Texas. So uh, there you go. And, and uh, we met there at Sagu, fell in love, got married, moved to Wichita Falls, where we've been youth pastoring for the last five and a half years. I loved it there, had a great time ministering to students. And then since June of this last year, we have been raising funds to get to Indonesia by August. And so we've been trying to reach our budget. And in, in, in the Summers of God World Missions, you have two budgets you have to raise. You have your monthly budget, which is people that give on a monthly basis, and you have your cash budget, which is one-time gifts. And you have these numbers that you have to meet. And if you don't meet those numbers, uh, you, you, don't go to, you don't go on the field. And, and so as new missionaries, we we're a little nervous about raising these funds. And some missionaries, it takes 15 to 18 months to raise it. But thanks to churches just like you who do support us on a monthly basis, I can tell you that our cash budget is now almost at 200% full, and our monthly budget is 100% full. Took us 10 months, and so all that is taken care of, and so it's, it's a blessing because now uh, we just have to have the baby, uh, and then we have some trainings we have to go to, and then we'll be in Indonesia by August. We'll be there for three years. Uh, first year will be spent in language school. Anybody know what they speak in Indonesia? Indonesian, that's right, yeah. Y'all didn't go to school in Arkansas, I can tell. Y'all knew, knew the answer. Uh, Indonesia. And then second and third year, we're going to plant ourselves in a Bible school there in Indonesia to help train up the next generation of leaders. But more than that, what we want to see happen is we want to see teams of Indonesian church planners develop, trained, and strategically sent into these villages and, and communities that have never had a church and go and plant the church where it's never been planted before. Amen. So tonight, I, I want to share with you, uh, turn with me the book of Matthew 28. You know, as a missionary, uh, you know, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission, right? We, uh, this, this verse of Scripture was what started the modern-day missions movement way back in the 1700s. There's this guy named William Carey, and he read this Scripture, and it said, Go into all the world, and he went to the people that, that ran his church, and he said, We should be going to the world. And they say, No, if God wants to save the world, he'll save the world, uh, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but that's how they thought. And William Carey read that and said, no, God will save the world, but he uses the church to do it. And so tonight, I've never preached on Matthew 28, 19, even though I'm a missionary. Uh, but tonight, I want to look at this, this verse, these passages of Scripture, because I believe they, they tell us what the church and who the church is supposed to be. You know, these are the last recorded words of Jesus uh, before he ascended to the Father. And I, I decided to look up some... Um, Famous last words, okay? So uh, some of you might know these people. Bob Hope. Anybody know who Bob Hope is, right? Comedian. Uh, before he passed away, his wife asked him where he wanted to be buried, and his last words were, surprise me. Uh, there was a, a general in the Union Army. His name was John Sedgwick, and uh, they, he said this. He said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dis... And then he died. Winston Churchill said, I'm bored with it all, and then he died. Marie Antoinette 
who was the, uh, the queen of France during the French Revolution. Uh, she, her last words were, pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose because she stepped on her executioner's foot as she went to the guillotine, polite to the end. And Pancho Villa, a Mexican revolutionary, as he was dying, he said these, he said, don't let it end like this. Tell them I said something important. Tell them I said something important. Just make something up. Let, let it be rememberable. And I think the last words of Jesus uh, are pretty remember, rememberable. That's an Arkansas word. They're pretty memorable. They show us who Jesus was, and they show us who Jesus wanted the church to be. I believe that the famous last words of Christ encapsulates what Christ wants the church to be. So Matthew 28, we're going to start actually at verse 16. So Jesus, he has been crucified. The Easter Sunday came and he rose from the dead, what we celebrated last Sunday. In verse 16, I want to pick up here and we'll go back later and, and kind of work through this passage together. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Say, all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. King James says, and lo, I'm with you always. That's why I don't like roller coasters. Jesus said, lo, I will be with you always. It was a joke. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Will you bow your heads with me this evening? Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word is true, that your word is powerful. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into the moment, this moment tonight. Take this word, apply it to our hearts, challenge us. Lord, take this passage that is so familiar to all of us. And Lord, let it speak a new word to our hearts. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's look at verse uh, 16. Now, the 11 disciples, so not 12, right? Judas has, has left them, went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So Galilee and the Gospel of Matthew is where it all began. This is where Jesus began his ministry. This is where Jesus ends his ministry. They go to Galilee, and they go to a mountain. Now, you read in the book of, of Matthew, mountains are a recurring element in the story. Jesus is always going to a mountain. He's going to a mountain to pray. He's going to a mountain to preach. And in and, and the crucifixion, he goes to a mountain to die, right? And then here in the Great Commission, he goes to a mountain uh, to ascend. It, it evokes another famous mountain in Scripture, uh, Mount Sinai. In the story of the Exodus, that, that mountain where Moses went to go talk with God and to commune with God. And it was at that mountain where the community of Israel, where the people of God were established, right? God redeemed them out of Egypt in the story of the Exodus, and he brings them to the mountain, and he gives them the law. It seals the deal. It, it, he owns them as his covenant people, right? This new identity that they were given. And so here in this passage, it's, it's the same thing, right? The, the disciples now who, who are 12 because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel, they, they come to Jesus, they meet with God on the mountain, and it's on this mountain that a new community would be established where God would do something new in the people of God called the church, right? Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some Doubt it. You know, I, I, I've read that passage so many times, and it really never it stuck to me that this passage, that, that, that Matthew says that they saw him and they worshipped him, but even though all of them worshipped him, some of them doubt it. And the way the language goes here in the original languages is, is that what it's saying is that they all worshipped him, but some of those that worshipped him still in their hearts felt doubt. 
Think about that for a moment. Why in the world would Matthew include that in this wonderful gospel story? You see, sometimes faith and doubt can both lead to worship. Let me give you just a story. I, I told you I was youth pastor before this, and I had a, a young man in my youth group who really, really wanted to believe in Jesus, but he had so many doubts. He had so many questions. I remember one night at, at youth camp, uh, we, uh, everyone was ready for bed. Everyone was in bed asleep. And if you've ever been to a youth camp, you know how long that takes, right? This, this, this was a long time. And, and they were all in bed, and he was sitting with me outside asking questions. Doubt. Doubting uh, the existence of Jesus. Doubting who God is. But as I passed through that young man, and I saw him worship even when there was some doubt in his heart. And I saw him read his Bible and engage in God's word, even when there was doubt in his heart. I saw in the midst of doubt, faith began to grow. It was through his worship and through his encounters with the living God. It wasn't a one-time thing. This, was a, this took five, pretty much five years of our ministry there that I saw this young man wrestling with doubts and worshiping in the midst of the doubts. And because he worshiped in the midst of the doubts, faith grew in his heart. Today, that young man loves Jesus, and he's serving Jesus, and he, he worships better than anybody else in the youth group. He's all about worshiping Jesus and loving Jesus. Why do I say this tonight? Is, is because God is okay with our doubts as long as we bend our knees and say, God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm facing some doubt. I'm, I'm facing some struggles. Are you really who they say you are? Are you really there? In those moments, we find ourselves in the same place as those early disciples, doubting, is God really doing this? Is this, is this real? But as we worship and as we draw near to him, doubt gives way to faith. And so if you're doubting this evening, I, what I would say to you is, is don't give up. Trust him. And in the midst of doubt, faith will grow. Verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All, all throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus has been teaching and proclaiming, and, and, and you can read there in the very beginning of Matthew, he leaves the wilderness, and he, the, Matthew says he goes about proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's a theme all throughout Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. What's that all about? He's been teaching that, that God's kingdom is coming. God promised in the Old Testament that he would come, set up his kingdom on earth, and through that, through the, the, his kingdom on, in Jerusalem, that all of the nations would come to him. You see, God was a missionary even in the Old Testament. God cared about the nations, and God cared about those outside of, of Israel. Jesus repeatedly tells Israel that they should turn from their sins because the kingdom of God has come. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is coming, right? And then Jesus comes and he says, repent, the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus Christ. He came uh, to become king. He came to, to become king, to begin the work, to, to set up his kingdom on this world. Although it wasn't a kingdom made with brick and stone, but it was a kingdom made in the hearts of men and women all over the world. Jesus comes to his people to become king, but instead of a crown of gold, he receives a crown of thorns. Instead of a golden throne, he sits on an old rugged cross. Instead of applause, he receives torture at the hands of the ones 
that he came to save. But unknowing to the Romans or the Jews, it was through the death and later the resurrection that Jesus would ultimately become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The enemy intended the crucifixion to be torture. The, the enemy intended the, the crucifixion to be a victory lap, but, but what he did not know is that the crucifixion was the coronation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that when Christ walked from the tomb, that he proved that he was who he said he was. He was vindicated by his heavenly father. And now here he is saying all authority on heaven and on earth. I, I have now come into my kingdom. The kingdom of God is come. And now he tells his disciples, boys, you and us, we're going to do this thing together. We are going to spread this kingdom, not, not by territory, not through the military, but we're going to spread it in the hearts of men and women all over this world. So all authority on heaven and on earth has been given me. I am the king, right? I am the king of kings and the Lord of Lords, and so now go, therefore, and make disciples. It's not just a, 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 a suggestion, it's a commandment from the King, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. See, this is who the people of God are meant to be. And so here he, he is telling, this is what the church will be. This is what the people of God will be. And, and so here in this passage, there's a lot of verbs, right? You can, you know, go back to Arkansas English, right? We got go, we got make disciples, we got baptize, we have teach, and we have command. A lot of verbs uh, in that sentence. And, and what you need to know is that in, in the Greek language, uh, even though you can have all as many verbs as you want in a sentence, there will only be one main verb. And you know that by looking at the endings, and you can tell what the main verb is in a sentence. Now, if you were to look at, at, at your Bibles tonight, what word would you think would be the main verb in that sentence? Go, right? In, in English, that's what it looks like, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples. But did you know that the main verb in this sentence is not go? The emphasis is not on go. The emphasis is on the verb make disciples. The church, what we are called to do is to make disciples. The disciples for Matthew have been these people all throughout the book. They've been listening to Jesus. They've been living with Jesus. They've been ministering with Jesus. They obey his commands. They are a part of his community, his kingdom. But they have, they have committed their, their whole lives to him. And Jesus instructs those disciples now, make disciples. I have made disciples, now you make disciples. The mission of, our, of the church, capital C, and the mission of this church, and the mission of those in the church is simply this, to make disciples. And Jesus tells them there's three ways that you do it. You do it by going, baptizing, and teaching. Going, baptizing, and and teaching. You can't have one without the other. You can't have two out of three. You have to have three out of three. But this is what the church is called to do. Let, let's look at this just for a little bit. Going. These disciples, they would go and tell the message. You read it in the book of Acts. They would say, basically, repent. The kingdom of heaven has come. Uh, uh, the, king is, the king came, uh, but you killed him. Uh, this is what he tells me. You can read there in the book of Acts. He says, you, you're the one that did it. You were ignorant. You, you killed the king. But what you didn't know is that by killing the king, you made him king. 
And so now, uh, make Jesus the king of your heart. Don't bend your knee to Caesar. Don't bend your knee even to the temple. Bend your knee uh, to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He, he, we know he's the king because we saw him die. And then he was alive three days later. He, he is the king. Now join his kingdom. Come join this community. Join this wonderful, glorious, global church. Live under his rule. Live under his authority. And be a part of the transforming work that God has called us to be a part of. Go. And it's only good news if people hear it. It's only good news for the people of Indonesia if it gets there on time. That is why we go. That is why we go to all nations. We can look at church history and we can see the places the disciples went. Peter went to Rome, was crucified by the emperor Nero. And, and, and the story goes that as Peter was led to this cross that he told his executioners, he said, I do not deserve to die in the same way that my Lord died. And so they picked up the cross and they turned it upside down. And Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew was, went as far as Russia would later be crucified himself in, in Greece. Thomas went as far as Syria and then to India, where we were told he was killed with four spears. Philip went to North Africa, where he was martyred. Matthew went to Ethiopia, Ethiopia, where he was stabbed with the sword and died. James went to Syria and was clubbed to death. Simon uh, the zealot went to Persia and then was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. John was boiled in hot oil, alive, and then exiled to the Isle of Patmos. They went as their Lord went, not in comfort, not in lavishness, but went suffering, embodying the suffering of Christ, proclaiming the good news, making disciples all over the world. You see, Jesus made his mission their mission. And in John, he makes it a lot more clear. John, in John, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. These disciples took the message of the gospel all over the whole, whole world in obedience to what Christ commanded. And look at where we are today. To make disciples, we must go. But also implied in this text is to make disciples, uh, they not only to make disciples we must go, but to be counted as the disciples ourselves we must go. You see, there is no looking at this passage and, and saying that a disciple does not go. Disciples, uh, once they become a disciple, they are therefore to go. It's a cyclical relationship. Missions is not something that we do. It's who we are. Mission is not something that we do. It is who we are. Now, I'm not saying everyone's called to be a missionary and, and go to Indonesia, but we, all call, we, are, we are all called to go to the supermarket. We are all called to go to that store or go to that gathering or, or go to that event or go to that person's house. We are all called to go. We are the people of God, I said it when I was last here, we are the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, sent on mission with God. It is who we are. We are discipling on the go. Some of us are called to go to the ends of the earth. Some of us are called to, to the ministry and called to go to new towns and go from sunny Florida all the way to Azle, Texas. Right, Pastor? Some of us are called to go from the Rednecks of Arkansas, the Wichita Falls. Some are called to those places, but we are all are called to do our part in his mission in our world. And even though our calling might not be to the ends of the earth, 
This does not negate our responsibility to ensure that the gospel gets there. And your, your church, you are a prime example of ensuring that that happens. So it says we make disciples by going, and then we make disciples by, by baptizing. You know, I think, especially as Pentecostals, we're really, you know, we, we, we sometimes can downplay the importance of, of baptism. You know, there's some people that say you have to be baptized to go to heaven, you know, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't love Jesus, you get baptized, you go down a dry center, you come up a wet one, right? There's, you know, we, we, we talk tell that all the time. But there's something important that was so important that Jesus included it in his last words. You see, baptism wasn't started by, by Christians. Baptism is actually was started by, by the Jewish people. When a Gentile, when someone who was not part of the Israelite faith wanted to come to, to be a, a, a Israelite, to become a Jewish person, they would go to the temple, and there would be pools there, and they would be baptized into the, the pool and thus enter into the, the community of Israel. And so you can imagine... Israelite Jewish people and all of a sudden here comes this wide-eyed guy from the desert John the Baptist and he's not telling Gentiles to repent and be baptized he's telling Jewish people to be repent to, to repent and be baptized he's telling them that, that to be Jewish is not enough it's it's faith it's it's coming becoming part of the family of God you must repent and, and turn and so Jesus he goes piggybacks right on that and says that the way we come into this new body the way that we signify our inclusion in the community is through a public act it's through the the ceremony of baptism and baptize, not in just to go down in the water, but baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, three in one. You know, you, you ever think about this? God, for all eternity, is, is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is forever a community. Three people and one God. And when we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we are baptized in the community of God, but we're baptized in the community of God. That we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but we are also baptized into the family. We are baptized into the community, to the, to the people of God. We, 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 just like the, the Gentiles would when they would be baptized and come into the, to the family of God. That when we, that, that baptism is a symbol that, that we were once away from God, that we were once far away, but we have made Jesus our king. And so now we are baptized to show the world where, that we are all in, that we are selling out for Jesus, that we are giving him our whole life jesus tells the disciples that part of this process of a discipleship <clears throat> to make disciples we must baptize a public rite of passage Let's see if i can open this without spilling i apologize we had a garage sale yesterday uh, selling our life a quarter at a time and uh, so my throat's a little scratchy being out in the weather but Jesus tells that baptism is part of discipleship, a public rite of passage, telling everyone that you have entered into the family of God. You have made Jesus your king. Baptism is an important step in the discipleship process because it proclaims our allegiance to Christ. And I, what I would say to you tonight is that if you have not been baptized, if you are ready to make that commitment, if you are ready to say that you are all in for Jesus, that if you're willing to say that you're willing to serve him for the rest of your life, I would encourage you to take that next step. It's more than a ceremony. It's a spiritual commitment that Jesus has commanded us to make. And Jesus wants us to call people to make that same sort of commitment. You see, baptism, the commitment that we're all called to make is epitomized at baptism we're all in 
We hold nothing back. We're sold out. We're, we're not going back. We're not looking behind us. We're, we're pushing forward. All we need is Jesus. And, and the message of the church is that same message. We call people not simply to come on Sunday mornings. We, we call people not even just to simply pray a, pray, pray a prayer. We call people to give their all to Jesus. That is our message. We say, give up your sin. Give up those things that you've been counting on to bring you happiness, to bring you pleasure, to bring you fulfillment. Cast those things away and make Jesus your king. Make Jesus your king and be a part of what he is going to do in this world. So baptizing, going, baptizing, then finally teaching. All throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus is shown to be a great teacher. In fact, there are five sections of teaching moments in the Gospel of Matthew. Some scholars think that, that Matthew, in a way, is kind of copying Moses a little bit. You know, Moses got the five books. Uh, Matthew's got these five sayings of Jesus, that Jesus is a great teacher as well as being the Son of God. He's also a, a great teacher, a great lawgiver. And Jesus, uh, he taught some pretty difficult things. Jesus, he said, if you, he said, you've heard that it said, uh, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hellfire. I don't know if Jesus could ride in the car with me in Dallas traffic, let me tell you. I'm joking. You have, he said this, you have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's not easy. <laughs> Chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, no, no, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's tough. That's tough. This is the hardest of all. Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The teachings of Jesus. And Jesus said, you are to teach everyone that when you make disciples, the way, part of the way you make disciples is that you teach them all that I have commanded you to do. The disciples of Jesus are to be living out the words of the teacher. It's to be the compass for their lives. But the disciples are not only just following the teachings of Jesus, but they are entrusted to pass on that teaching to others. You know, in the, in the days of Jesus, there was an office in the Jewish community called a rabbi. And a rabbi would, would study for years and years. We know this was what the Apostle Paul was studying to be. The, they, would be they would steep themselves in the law and study and study and study. And then they would have some disciples and they would teach them. And then those disciples would be the ones who would teach the community. And then they too would later become a rabbi and then they would have disciples and then those disciples would be you get what I'm going there was this 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 thing that was already happening at, at the time and what Jesus says is that the same way what the rabbis are doing you're going to do that too you're going to make disciples you're going to teach them my words and 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 it's not going to be just repeating commandments but it's going to be living them out in your daily life and then you too will Make disciples who will turn and to do the same thing. The church is a discipling community. It's not a, a social club. It's not a fun place to go, although it probably is a fun place to go a lot of the times. But it's not just that. It is a discipling community. It's a place that we go to be convicted. 
It's a place that we go to be encouraged. It's a, it's a place that we go to, to be challenged in our walk with the Lord. And, and, and the church is called to do that. But I also believe that there is an individual calling on the life of the disciples. It wasn't just the churches that the disciples were going to make. It was them themselves that they were going to be people who would disciple and teach the words of Jesus. We are all to be teachers of the words of Jesus, every single one of us, not just pastor, not just me, but all of us are with standing with the disciples tonight. We have been commanded to make disciples by, by teaching that we should have relationships in our lives, all of us, where we can share what God has been speaking to us relationships where others feel like they can bring correction in our lives. We don't like that, right? We, those relationships where mutual discipleship can take place. You see, you weren't called to do it alone. You weren't called to do it alone. God's greatest gift to the world was, the, was, was Jesus Christ and, and the Holy Spirit. But you know what I believe comes right there in the top three? It was the church. Yeah, she's had her trouble. She hasn't always had her best moments in the public eye. But she's still strong. And the body of Christ together, we are called to, to disciple one another, to stand with one another, to encourage one another, to pray with one another, to help each other grow and become more like Jesus. It's a calling not only on the pastor, but on every single one of us. We are called to teach the words of Jesus. Listen, listen to me tonight. We want disciples, not converts, right? We, we, we don't want people that just can pray the prayer. We want those who will say, I'm all in. You see, making disciples, living a life that we make disciples, it's more than just a one-time witness. It's more than just a one-time a conversion experience. It's choosing to walk with people and lead them to Jesus. It's choosing to walk with our brothers and sisters and help them become more like Jesus. It's choosing to walk with that neighbor, not just witness one time and be done, but to lead them. To Jesus. You see, this is, this is what I believe in a nutshell. This is what Jesus is calling the church to do. Disciples make disciples. Disciples make disciples. You see, when you look at Scripture, you will never find a disciple who does not make disciples. And if we want to be his disciple, that all of us should be in the business of making disciples. Even if you've only been saved a year, listen, you can still tell people what God has done in your life. Even if you've only been saved three months, hey, I bet you know what a cuss word sounds like. You could probably tell that person they probably shouldn't be saying it. We are all called to make disciples. It's who we are. We do it by going. Wherever we go, we make disciples. We do it by baptizing. We call people to make that commitment. And we do it by teaching, by studying the scripture together, by going deep into God's word and letting that word wash us and transform us and change the way that we act and the way we think. Jesus, has, the risen king, has given us his mission. But this is what he says at the very last passage. I haven't read it yet. And behold, I am with you always. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the world, Jesus is with us. You know, Matthew begins his gospel with, you know, he has the genealogy of Jesus there in chapter 1. But shortly after that, we, we find a, a, a girl named, named Mary. And the angel comes to her and, and says, you will give birth to a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Matthew begins his gospel by showing that God is with us. God came in the person of Jesus Christ. But what he also shows us at the very last verse of the last chapter of his book, 
He says, not only was God with us in the person of Jesus when he walked this earth, but as he gives the church the mission, he says, the same way I was with you when I walked with you and I talked with you and you saw me do the miracles and you saw me move and you saw me act, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh, church, I'm thankful that as we go about making disciples, that God is with us, that Jesus is with us. You know, what's great, Jesus said that he says, it's, good, it's a good thing that I go. Jesus said, it's a good thing that I ascend to my heavenly father, because if I don't ascend to my heavenly father, the comforter won't come. What could ever be possible? What, what possibly could be better than Jesus right beside us? Jesus tells them, you know what's better than Jesus right beside you? Jesus within you. The, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus is with us as we make disciples. He's with us as we go to that event. He's with us when we go to that family table. He's with us when we go to that neighbor. He's with us. He's with us. He's with us. We make disciples with Jesus. So tonight, this, this, is, this is my simple message to you. And number one would be support the work of the church. Uh, I, 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 you know, I think missions is a great thing. I'm a missionary, right? I think we should all be supporting what God is doing around the world and what God is doing here in Azle, Texas. This, this is part of that mission. That is part of that great commission. But it does not negate our personal responsibility to make disciples in our own lives. My challenge to you tonight would be bring people to Jesus. Live your life bringing people to Jesus. Live your life going. Live your life baptizing and calling people to that commitment. Live your life talking about the teachings of Jesus and what Jesus has been speaking to you, what Jesus has been doing in your life. And the third thing is simply this. Enjoy the discipleship of the church. I didn't say endure. I didn't say put up with. Enjoy the discipleship of those brothers and sisters that God has put around you. Don't just keep relationships here, but find those relationships. It's not with everybody, but find those relationships where they can disciple you, where you can disciple them. And I promise that if you won't go it alone, you'll go further than you ever thought possible. You see, all of us are products of people taking time to disciple us. You know, when I, when I think of my youth pastor, I don't think of the messages he preached. I didn't hardly listen. <laughs> I don't think of those messages. You know what I think of? I think of those rides in the car. I think of those times hanging out and going to games or going to the football games, the baseball games there in town. I don't think of the, the messages. I think of the relationship. I think of those words, those, those challenges. I, I think of those times where he prayed with me. You see, the discipleship isn't just with the microphone. I found that in youth ministry, 90% of the discipleship I did was without a microphone in my hand. Discipleship isn't just about what comes from the stage. Discipleship is about us discipling together. When I think of those people, it, it's, it's not people that had a mic. It's people in my church, men and women who were older than me, some, some saints that have been there, done that, who who loved me and who cared about me and who, who, who encouraged me and who spoke life into my spirit and who, 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 who were corrected me at times when, as we say in Arkansas, I got a little too big for my britches, right? The, the, these, these lovely people who were willing to disciple me. For me, it, it was my parents. I was blessed with Christian parents. And listen to me, parents, it's not the church's responsibility to disciple your kid. It's not the church's responsibility to disciple your kid. The church is here to help. The church is here to, to stand beside you and equip you and, and to pray with your kids and to pray, pray for your kids, but it's not the church's responsibility. It's yours. Disciple your children. You see, think of what God could do in a church that is willing 
to just go back to what's basic, willing to make disciples, willing to, to, to do the discipleship process with each other and to grow to become more like Jesus, who's willing to go out and get the disciples outside of their doors and call them to discipleship and call them to put faith in King Jesus. Imagine what God could do. Will you bow your heads with me tonight if I can get someone to come play for me? Tonight, I, sim simple, simple message. And what I want to do tonight is I want to open up these altars, steps, front row. I want to open up just at your seat. And I want us to take a, a moment tonight to just think, to ponder, to examine our, our hearts. You know, when, when we were praying earlier, Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can deny Jesus is alive. Shout to all the people, be healed in Jesus.